Welcome to the Back to Me podcast, where we help multicultural incoming freshmen women and men manage their entire college experience throughout post-graduation to successfully transition into entrepreneurship and corporate workspaces as new hires. Back to me. Hello, everyone. It's your host, Yoli Tamu. In James 4.2, the scripture reads, You have not because you ask not. As we continue to get financially fit during this Financial Literacy Month, we invite back scholarship acquisition specialist and financial professional, Carol Pinkney Hart. In this episode, we explore how many students and parents may be spinning their wheels in an attempt to secure scholarships and or investment in profitable college savings plans. Ms. Hart encourages you to get to know the three money rules that will improve your mindset around money and help you financially prosper in the way many large corporations are prospering today, despite the current economic climate. Find out why investing in an index life insurance account may be a better option than pursuing a 529 college savings plan after all. It is Financial Literacy Month, and we are inviting back one of our powerful guests, Ms. Carol Pinkney Hart. How you doing? Girl, I am blessed by the best. I am happy to be here. And I just love that introduction. It was full of uplift. I'll take it. Oh, hey, I'm excited to talk to you because, you know, offline we've been talking and it has been powerful. So (laughs) (laughs) I know that our listeners are going to gain so much from you. Now, when you were with us last time, you were a scholarship acquisition specialist. And I believe you still work with families and scholarships, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I do. Great. But for this conversation, we're going to take a deeper dive into money itself so that our listeners, which include students, which include parents, which include just professionals, career professionals, that it's time to move to the next level when it comes to our money. A big deal. It's a big deal. And so when you and I were speaking, we were just really talking about understanding the concept of money in the first place. Can we just start there? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So a little bit about me. I definitely taught school for 35 years and I retired at the height of the pandemic in June of 2020 it's because I got introduced to an entire different world related around finance and uplifting the literacy concept and comprehension of money. Something that never existed in my world. And I think that's probably the case for this community here is that we are taught very early to be consumers and to work, and to quote unquote, you know, say, but we don't know what that looks like and how that works, but we don't have real knowledge on how money works. Mm. And once I realized that I had been in the back of the class, I wasn't even invited into the classroom, to be honest, about having discussions about how money worked, I had to seriously decide that I am going to be an ambassador for what this looks like, because I've got to leave this world better than I found it. And everybody I sit with, I still help people with finances, with scholarships. Absolutely. Because that's important. It goes hand in hand. But my real bread and butter of what I absolutely love is to make sure you understand that money has rules. If you were to say, I want to be a pilot, there's rules to doing that. I think I want to join a marathon race. There's rules to how to run a marathon. There's rules for everything. But we're never in the room or at the table where conversations are about how does money work. So we blindlessly go into it just doing whatever we think we know is right. And we make boo-boos and we don't want to even talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then I remember you saying that even as early as elementary school, there was some early messaging to just help us settle as consumers. Yeah. Yeah. I remember probably my early stages of teaching that I had sixth grade. And these people came in. I don't remember who they were or why they were coming in, but they gave every child what's called an interest inventory survey. And the message was, we're going to help you find your strengths. We're going to help you figure out what you're really good at. So now you can start planning your future and know what you're going to grow up to be. Well, the problem with that is that we all evolve. You know, what you liked and enjoyed when you were 12 changed probably very differently when you were 19. 
But because our brains are so malleable and we're so impressionable, we get these messages early that there's really only one or two ways to slice a cake. And we know there isn't. So that starts early. And then we get to teenage years, we get a job. Why? Because we need to have money. See, money is always in the conversation, but it's never defined. And then we're taught how to be consumers. Now, your audience who are college freshmen, they know when they walked into that campus as freshmen and they're figuring out the dorm and everything else, there's tables set up from credit card companies. Right. Early on, you get sucked into the system of getting latched into an entirely different arena and you don't understand it. And we sign off on that so easily. And that is where I come in and I really am passionate about dismystifying that because, you know, everything's about money. You live where you live based upon money. You drive what you drive. You eat what you eat. I bet you don't fly first class every time you get on a plane because that is about money. And so my real passion with young people, whether they're 18 or 22, is to just say, listen, let's have a real adult conversation that you probably haven't had a chance to participate in so that you understand that money has rules. And once you know the rules, then you can play the game. Mm. All right, let's get into it. What's what's rule number one? (laughs) Your money has got to be working for you. And it's called compound interest. You can never work as hard as your money can work for you. Your money can work way harder for you, but it won't if you don't have it in the right place. And what happens is is our mommies and our daddies and our nanas and everybody that loves us tells us to save money, put it in the bank, don't spend all your money, save for a rainy day. The banks aren't about saving money. Banks are in the lending business. You specifically go to a bank because you need a loan for whatever that may look like. But if you want your money to make money, you can't go there. Do you know what the interest rate is at a bank? Girl, it's 0.0125%. Wow. Let me repeat that. 0.0125%. You don't even get a penny on your money. But yet and still, we say, we're going to bank with you and hope that you do what we do. Doesn't work that way, sis. Now, somebody's saying, no, 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 no. I have a credit union savings account. You're right. I'm sorry. Credit unions will give you one or 2%. My bad. Still, where are you going to get growth on that? You're working 10,000%, but your money's not even making 1%. So that's the first rule. The second rule is you got to understand how taxes work. We always hear about taxes when there's a political race and someone wealthy is running and they want to look at their taxes and they never ever a rebellion or they realize they're not paying taxes. Most taxes are paid in middle and working class. Why? The wealthy don't pay taxes. It's simple. And we now know what that looks like. So the second rule is you got to know how taxes work. And the wealthy participate every single day in what we call tax advantage accounts. We either defer taxes and pay them later. That's a conversation. Or we pay taxes now. But they're in a scenario where they don't ever pay taxes. So why are we paying all the taxes? It's designed for us not to know. And then the last rule is you got to know what the investment options look like. You really, in this country, there's only three options. They're not really hard. See, the rules are easy. You just need to be taught. And so once you know that you don't have to get a fixed account, you don't have to be in a variable up and down, you can really be what's called an index account where you never lose money, you only make money. Let me say that again. You never lose money, you only make money. Who would not want that? whether you're 19, 22, or 92. Nobody wakes up and says, oh, I want to lose money today. Nobody. But yet and still, we go with the status quo and we do what we're taught. And our parents love us, but they can't teach what they don't know, Yoli. Right. Period. So now, in my last interview, we were talking about all of the tools that are available, you know, the FAFSA, scholarships. So we can get into that in a minute. The 529 plan. I know you have a feeling about the 529 plan. So when we speak of index accounts and investing, how do you feel about the 529 plan? Is that a good investment or what type of index plans are you talking about that would be an opposite? I'm a big fan of thinking outside the box. And 529s are specifically available primarily either with an investment company or a bank. I've already told you what that looks like. Their lens and their structure is very limited. So the problem with a 529 is one or two things. One, the money's going to grow so slow, a snail might be able to run that race. Or you're going to put it in investment where it's going to go up and down with the market. So now you're vulnerable to not actually having what you thought. 
more importantly, is when it comes time to apply for that free federal money, any money in that 529 is viewed by them as income. So now you got to let them know I've been saving this money. And because you have been saving it, well, for whatever reason you thought was good, it's actually going to lower what they're going to give you on a federal level because you got more money, as little as it might be. And because I love people finding their individual walks in life, you could have been saving for 529 and your child decides they want to be a pastry chef and go to Paris and live. So all that money in that 529 is limited. It's got to be used for college. But it's tax-free. It's tax-free. No, it's not. It's tax-free if you stay within the structure of it. And more importantly, I've had plenty of clients tell me when they meet with me on another level that I got bit hard in my 529. I didn't even know. And that's the real problem for me is that we don't find out that water's wet until we jump in the pool. It's definitely what big industry does. And it is to invest in a cash value life insurance policy. This book right here called Money, Wealth, Life Insurance tells about how the wealthy have used life insurance as a tax-free personal bank. I call it family banking. Do do family banking to supercharge their savings. Walt Disney funded Disneyland through the cash value in his life insurance. J.C. Penney's funded his stores, his corporation through the money he had here. Because think about it, all these companies started during the Great Depression where nobody had money because it was all in banks and investments. But life insurance is a whole nother industry. It's not tied to that. And so story after story, Foster Farms, I could go on and on and on. Every single body that understands how money works never trusts an investment company to do it because they know it's volatile. Now, if you want to play, if you want to play, you got some discretionary money. I just want to see how it does in the market. Then fine, have fun. But that's not middle America. That's not my neighborhood. That's not my family. We aren't trying to play with our money. We need some guarantees. And so the wealthy get that very early because you can have multiple accounts. That's another band. You can have multiple accounts of these, several. You can have five, 10, 20 of these kinds of accounts. And you don't ever have to worry about losing any money because it's not tied to the market. It's indexed in life insurance. It's a game changer. Mm. So they would have to know someone like yourself. Do you consider yourself a financial planner or a financial strategist? I consider myself and reference myself as a financial professional. So I never want to yuck anybody's yum, but I am very, very clear that financial advisors typically work for an investment company. Mm which automatically reduces their wealth of knowledge and what they're going to be tied to because they have to work within that industry and push that product. You know, if I'm a vegan, I'm not going to be selling you steaks at Sizzler. It just doesn't, it's not on the same palette. So most of my clients who have children, I've done about five this week, instantly get one of these policies because they're thinking longevity. Not only, Carol, do I want to have flexibility, but I don't want to have to worry about losing any money. I want to make sure the money's there. And then you and I are at this age where we're looking at retirement. I'm already retired, technically. This becomes a retirement. So think about, think how powerful that is for a five, six, seven-year-old to already have their retirement set up. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very powerful that you said that they can use that money for college or to build a business. Anything, anything, it doesn't matter. So if your child decides, I don't really want to go the college route, Family-wise, you guys might have a conversation about that because that's your dream, but it may not be theirs. And it doesn't mean they're going to be sitting on the table, you know, I mean, on the table, at, at sitting on a chair watching TV all day. They have hopes and dreams and aspirations because what I've figured out with younger people is that COVID was a big teacher. And what it taught them, all of us, but for sure, it taught that younger generation that came about where they couldn't get out. They couldn't have outlets is that we cannot be reliant on big structure and bureaucracy to take care of us because it literally failed us. This global pandemic, we all know, could have been avoided, but we were so reliant upon others to make decisions that we hope were in our best interest and that didn't happen. And then it went into employment. It went into schooling. It went into all these scenarios where things just didn't quite work out. And we thought it would because you guys told us, we got you, but we'll figure it out. Update tomorrow. Mm -mm. 
So now if they were to invest in something like an index that is tax free as well. Correct. And so, like you said, they can pull it out at any time. Is there like a time frame? Like it, it definitely needs to stay there for a while? Good question. It is so individualized. For example, some people have the resources to invest more faster. Some people need to be slow and steady. Some people want to do something quick and fast. It just depends on how you design it. I've had some people that hit heavy for five years and then they're done, but it's still in place and it's still tax free. I've had some that want to keep it for the next 20, 30, 40 years. So it just has to be structured so that it, I like to say I like people to find their sweet spot because your goals will look different than a 22-year-old who's just got a six-figure income with Dale. And now he understands how money works, so he's not going to put his money in a 401k because God knows what that looks like when the time comes. But that will look different for a single mom newly divorced with four kids and she's 40. Powerful stuff. So along with an index plan, there are scholarships. Yes. So that was your sweet spot when you were here last time. So And it still means a lot to me. Yes. So please tell us about this scholarship game because every scholarship is not created the same and looking for them is a whole task in itself. So tell us about that. So the biggest thing is that schools cannot really help you with this journey because they're not in the business of that. They're in the business of education. So the best thing to do, obviously, besides meeting with me, is to understand you can't do what others do, which is I'm going to go on the internet and find scholarships. One of the best things I teach, one is the mindset, is that literally your audience has sat in room after room after room and left money on the table. Whether it was a baby shower, a Super Bowl party, you were on a cruise, you were at a jazz concert. People work with and for entities, organizations, sororities, fraternities, churches. There's a bazillion entities that have scholarships available for young people, but they don't walk around with it tattooed on their forehead. So the best thing I teach people is when you meet people, you know, first of all, be personable. We're like communal people. And then literally, I teach my juniors and my seniors, when people find out that young people are headed to college, it's an instant magnet. Oh my God, this is your last year of high school. That's exciting. What's the plan? Where are you going next? This is my script. Oh my God, I am so excited, but my family and I are on an aggressive scholarship journey. Who do you know that helps students like myself? I teach parents the same thing. So the parents would change a little bit. My son and I, or my daughter, I are on an aggressive scholarship journey. Who do you know that helps students like them? Like I could throw out a couple of names now, scholarships that I'm sure your audience may not know. For example, have you ever heard of Lady Like? Lady Like. Mm -mm. That's a scholarship specifically given to young women of color, seniors in high school in the greater Los Angeles area. Were you aware that Judge Maybelline has a few scholarships? Mm -mm. She has deep pockets, very deeply connected to the community. Were you aware that GLAC, which is a greater Los Angeles African-American Chamber of Commerce, they have an amazing scholarship. And it goes on and on and on. So the one thing I do is I teach you to think outside the box. I give you the script. I give you the words. I show you what to say and how to do it. When you get to the end of this, this journey, like you have a lot of seniors now, and they might be at that point, do I go to this school or this school? They're giving me this, but they're giving me this. I can teach you how to write an appeal letter. Appeal what they have offered you because, Yoli, this is so important. When kids get their acceptance letters, and here's the financial aid award letter, they're taking their entire pie of money they have available, and they're slicing that pie into all the pieces of all the kids that they say they're going to let come in. All those kids don't come to the school. Right. Which means they got more money. But they don't call you up and say, hey, Yoli, we got more money because 35 kids aren't coming. Would you want some money? So just knowing how that game works, the power of networking, and literally, I don't want to water it down, but my most successful clients are successful because they understand the power that a closed mouth does not get fed. So they walk into rooms, they have conversations, they li- literally, it's biblical, you have not because you ask not. And if I can teach you that, and then you really walk the walk and you embody that space of expecting abundance, expecting to meet the right people. Being okay with writing a letter to everybody in your email checklist because who knows? Literally, you and I met because 
you know somebody, knew somebody, knew somebody. Contacts have contacts and people know people who know people. But we kind of sit at school and we hope that our counselors are going to help us with that. And it's not their forte. They do what they do. Your hairstylist cannot change the oil in your car. She's great at doing your hair, but she can't do that. So high school, college counselors cannot tell you about the journey I've done because I did it with my daughter. And it is not for the faint of heart, but it is so worth it. It is bold. It is aggressive, but it is proven to be successful. And so with the family that may contact you, you're demystifying the whole concept of of grant searching and scholarship searching because you kind of already know how to narrow it on down to where the money is. That's what I'm hearing you say. And that is correct. Because sometimes it's what you don't do that's more powerful than what you do do. Because when we spin our wheels in the wrong direction, we lose stamina, we lose hope. We lose interest and we give up. And that is, to me, very disheartening. But if you understand what to do and don't do this stuff, I can't tell you how many times I've sat in. I did one last week. I have to get where the kid went to school. Oh, I, hold on. I can think about it. Downey, some school in Downey. I, she's a senior. I said, so tell me how many scholarships you've applied for so far. She said two. I said, awesome. Which two did you apply for? First of all, that number is crazy in March. Two. I said, tell me which two. One, she said McDonald's. Then the other one, she said, was Nike. Now, tell me what's your immediate thought about that. So did everybody else. (laughs) There you go. Exactly. That's large, national, web-based, boom. So when you applied for Nike, they probably got about 20 other applications. And here's the short end of it. Somebody within the infrastructure of Nike on the selection committee going to give it to the person they know. And you're just not going to get it. So I equipped her and her father. And luckily, he has about five other younger daughters. God bless America on that one. So while this kind of end of the road for this kid, it'll look very different for his other children. Because I just could explain to him clearly that's not going to happen. I said, but did you realize that your ethnicity, your race, and your culture has professional organizations that literally have a lot of scholarships? Let's talk about that. Were you aware that your mother works for such and such a firm? And do you know that they have scholarships? And just all those other conversations. And then I understand that kids are so incredibly busy and their bandwidth can only go so far. And I let parents know now, you're either going to pay now or pay later. So I'm equipping the parents as well as the children. Because my daughter got as much money as she got because I literally took the bull by the horns. I had to steer the car. She didn't have a license to do this. I know what it looks like. And think about it. It's not your fault. Your kid has never, ever, 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 ever been hungry. So I pray and hope they've always been able to turn on a light switch. They can always flush a toilet. So they've never gone without. Only you know what it looks like to get a bill and not know how to figure out, how am I going to pay this? So them not wanting to take this aggressively, it's because of the way we raised them. But now we're here and we got to just look at it very differently. Amazing. And then, you know, we've always had listeners as well that are on the fence about whether they're going to go to college. You know, some of them are just going to be going right into careers, vocational interests. Is there funding out there for vocational interests? It is, and it's not my forte, but I believe there's always something with someone. So what I say is, let's say vocationally, maybe you want to be a plumber. I'm sure there's mentorship, there's companies, there's programs, there's trade schools that will have some sort of tutelage. And you just go and ask them those questions. Because again, it's oftentimes who you know, not what you know. Right. I mean, that's what you do. Your toilet backs up. You say, girl, you got a good plumber. Right. You don't go to Google. You literally go to somebody you know. And it's the same way in that journey. Mm. Wow. Well, I'm so grateful that I know you. How about that? (laughs) I'm grateful as well, love. I'm grateful as well. And with that being said, my students that are, or your students are, I call them mine because we're all in the same village that are looking at going into the workforce. I completely support that and whatever, but I am also very clear about the fact that we can't always be very reliant upon that. And so I want people to really explore, consider, just kind of, you know, taste of what it looks like to be an entrepreneur. Like everything that we use and experience was once a thought or an idea. Who knew? When you and I were kids, post notes were not a thing. Didn't that post notes change your life? Oh my God, I could write a note on a sticky, take it on and take it off and not damage the paper. (gasps) Who thought, right? 
You mean I don't have to have a charger? I can actually get a mobile charger and take it with me? So, you know, if you've got a passion, if you've got an idea, run with it. Go for it. Because at the end of the day, this is not a dress rehearsal. We don't get to come back and do this journey again. And I'm finding more and more young people, again, COVID taught them that as well, where they saw their parents, you know, lose their jobs, not have a place to work. And so they aren't as reliant on the bureaucracy of, quote unquote, being an employee. But we got to eat. We got to have health care. We need to have shelter. But I'm also the fact that I've met so many people under 30 in a variety of settings that have two or three different businesses and or still might be an employee somewhere. And they are slowly evolving themselves because there's just so many options out there. It's like a genius. It's a genius. I met a young lady. She had a, a personal underwear garment that was just, it was just the most interesting thing I've ever heard of. And she worked for, I think it was, oh God, I forget what corporation. I can't remember now. But she's went off on the side and started this whole new product line and bringing in her more money than her nine to five. And see, I think that's key to say is that, you know, definitely stay on the job until you're ready to venture. Oh, absolutely. I, I didn't retire from teaching and do my other business until I knew I could financially fill the gap. And that's a big deal. But that's why financial literacy is so important. And it starts early. So the, the earlier you know it and teach it, then you can move accordingly, whether it's for scholarships or protecting your assets, building a legacy. You know, we don't need to leave debt and a Volkswagen. We need to leave like serious money. And it comes from your understanding of how money works. And it starts in college. Definitely. And in college and even on the job, we need to develop our soft skills. We need to develop our customer service skills. I mean, if you're going to venture out and become an entrepreneur, you have to have people skills. <laughs> that part. Exactly. And then that and I remember when I left teaching in the pandemic, I was in a meeting with the administrators and my superintendent. And they said, well, this is your last meeting. What is it you'd like to leave us with? I said, take care of children. I don't care about curriculum. I don't care about grades. I don't care about any of that. But if you don't take care of these children's heart, their mind, their soul, their body, you're going to fail miserably. Yes. And we need to change what that looks like. And I'm hoping I haven't gone back in a school setting that we're doing a better job of that. But those people skills are huge. They are everything. And I train people to do what I do. And I can teach you skills, but I can't teach you mindset. I can't give you confidence at 40. That's hard for me to do. That's a, that's a hard wall to break. And that makes everything. Because think about it, Yoli. People do business with people they trust and they like. Period. They will teach the rest. Exactly. If they like you, they'll teach you the rest. They will. They will. It was a funny thing on Instagram that said, girl, just go on line that resume because they're going to train you anyway. And I just laughed at it because it's true. I mean, I used to train teachers when I was teaching and I would get some people and I'd look at their first lesson. And I'd be like, how did you get this far in the program? And it's probably because she passed all the book knowledge. But I'm like, you cannot teach. And now you want me to groom you. In certain cases, depending on the individual, the university, I'm just like, I'm not going to do it. Next caller, take her. She, she's yours. I can't do it. I won't do it. Mm -hmm. This is such an important conversation because we're talking about making money and all of that is important. But yes, if you're not showing up as a human being, an individual that can connect with people without having some sense of entitlement and expectation, but real genuineness, you're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> it is. It's true. And I had a gentleman that's one of my mentors. He's a regional VP for an insurance company. And he said, Carol, we will make a emotional decision and make it rational when it comes mm. to money. When it comes to money. Mm. It's so true. You and I would go out to dinner and know we got $20 cash. And you say, girl, this lobster is $59.95, but I deserve it. <laughs> now you ordered the lobster and you put it on a credit card and you, you know you justify it because you deserve it. And you do. But then the day you are going to have to think about that 30 days from now when you got to pay for it. Right. So can nobody stays awake at night wondering if their shoes are going to match their purse on Easter. We worry at night about money. How are we going to pay for this? Can I retire? Do I have enough to feed my family? Will I have enough for a family vacation? What happens if the water heater breaks? Da, 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 da. So that's why what I do is so powerful. The more you know, the more you are equipped. And the sooner you know it, you can teach it. 
to the people that you love the most. You're teaching what is not being taught. Exactly. It's not. It's not. Which is why the other part of what I love is the fact that I can teach others what I know. It's a system of knowledge about a curriculum that is not being taught. And I've sat in rooms where people don't look like us. And I start talking about things and they kind of look at me like, so when did you get into the business? I'm not in the business. I'm a business owner. I'm in the educational business. And I just leave it at that. And I know they're just like, mm, okay, that's fun too. Well, listen, I'm, I'm just so glad you're with us. What's the name of that book again? It's called Money, Wealth, Life Insurance. It's written by Jake Thompson. It is on Amazon. It will take you 40 minutes to read. If you're a slow reader, 50 minutes. Okay. But I'll leave you just with this one little nugget. Bank of America, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, and U.S. Bank have over billions of dollars. The Bank of America has the most, over $19 billion. U.S. Bank, over $5 billion of their assets are in life insurance. They use the money they make. They don't pay taxes on it. They're getting compound interest. It's tax-free. They take these assets and that's how they pay employees. That's how they pay their pensions. That's how they pay their benefits. So they're always ahead of the game. But we give them our little money and they don't even give you a penny for it. We got to change that. Yes. Cut them out. Cut out the middleman. Do what they do. If they're doing it, come on. You can be a copycat. Just copy the right cat. Mm. <laughs> I love that. Wow. Copy <laughs> the right cat. Copy the right okay. cat. That's it. So now how can they reach you on Instagram or do you have a website? My website is easy, but it's because it just gives you my personal information. It's really my, it's carolhart.net. It's real simple, but Carol has an E on the end. So it's C-A-R-O-L-E-H-A-R-T.net. My Instagram is lowercase I for I, then heart, and then scholarships. And then you can find me on Facebook on Carol Hart. Love it. And if they know you personally, you have free reign to give out my phone number, my email to anybody. <laughs> okay. Yes. If they know me personally, I love that. Yeah, they absolutely just say, oh, girl, give me that lady's number. I'd love yes. to. For sure. Well, this yeah. has been a blessing. I mean, for Financial Literacy Month, thank you for just opening minds. Hopefully that has been the goal here. And that is what has been accomplished, that people are thinking beyond the box. Absolutely. And I would like to say this. As my last final word, be okay with asking questions. I think many of us find ourselves in scenarios, whether we're on a first date or we've been working for somebody forever. We don't ask questions because we don't want to appear to be unknowledgeable, stupid, or don't know. Ask. It will change your life when you get the right answer. And you don't know what it is until you ask. I love it. I feel like a genius with this podcast. <laughs> many questions you are that I ask. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you for being with us. And I wish you so much success, continued success. And I hope a whole lot of parents reach out to you because they definitely need you. I sure hope they do as well. And it can be for your nieces, your nephews, if it's not the children that came out of your personal body space. Anybody. I mean, we got to make it better. I love it. Okay. Thank you, love. All right. You take care of yourself. We'll talk real soon. I will do it. You too, love. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us. As you consider the three money rules, consider other investment options and practice developing those people skills with your family and friends. For more information about other episodes, remember to subscribe to the Back to Me podcast, College and Beyond. I'm your host, Yoli Tamu. Leave a review at the end of this podcast. And if you would like to learn more about other special events, join the Back to Me podcast Facebook group or simply text Back to Me to 833-206-4565. Until next time, be well.